Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 140. What's in a word? Some of the best word-based party games. I'm Sean, and with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Remember, we record live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. So tonight in the Ask the Bellhop segment, we've got someone looking for word-based party games. And we've got a plethora of game suggestions for them. Then we answer the question, <clears throat> is the new edition of World's Fair 1893 worth picking up in our game room segment? We finish off with a bunch of games in our week in review, including Space Base, Tapestry, Guildmaster, uh, Reef, Riff Raff, I wanted to call it Reef, Riff Raff, and a little bit more on World's Fair 1893. And most of these games, we actually played both physically and digitally. So we'll be sharing thoughts on those two platforms as well. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. Again, we've got a lot of awesome feedback this past week, and we'll only be highlighting some of it here. Thanks everyone who takes the time to interact with our content. Now we're going to start with the content from Melanie about Magical Kitties Save the Day. I love the idea of this game and my kids were really excited to go through the solo adventure and create their characters. But after that point was when we struck problems. As you mentioned in your review, the game is problematic for anyone who has no experience being a GM or yeah. didn't even know what a GM was before buying this game. We are just overwhelmed and stuck. Myself and kids have never played any RPG. Have you got any tips for where we, I, could find some very simple instructions or recommendations for some fun, easier RPG mm -hmm. for practice? We love kitties and magic, and we have great characters and humans developed, but we just don't know what to do next. I was so wrapped to have finally found something that we could all play, but after getting through the solo adventure, my eldest got very frustrated by the lack of structure and guidance and is basically thrown in the towel. Well, thanks so much for your comment there, Melanie. And I am very sorry to say we were right. Like, I'm not trying to say I told you so. I'm sad that we, that, that my opinion of this game seems to be true. Um, 3D through Magical Kitty Seat the day and then running it, I was very concerned that this game was not approachable for new players who are brand new to RPGs. Now, being an experienced player, I was guessing. Like, it just seemed that way to me, but this confirms it. This is a perfect example of that happening right here. Despite the cute and family-friendly theme, I think this game is targeted at experienced gamers. Maybe as a way for veterans to get their kids to the table. I don't know. Like, Atlas Games is a, a, a big RPG company, right? They're not a kids toy company producing games normally directed at kids i think the problem is that this is boxed and sold in a way that can and will appeal to new gamers it looks approachable and easy what i really think atlas should do and if you're listening atlas maybe this is a great idea is put out a magical kitty save the day starter kit something that's really simple more family friendly and linear that just walks you through everything step by step instead of going, hey, here's a neighborhood. Hey, here's a bunch of humans. Hey, now you're going to take a human and you're going to find a problem and you're going to direct it at the problem and then do this and follow these five different structures to tell a story. Oh, and here's a bunch of stats for all that stuff. Have fun. Because that's pretty much what that box set does. Yeah, it's a tough line to walk as publishers try to balance between new and experienced players and or GMs because a lot of more experienced players kind of will walk away from something that yeah. appears too easy. And That's so true. they they need to find that balance. And unfortunately, it's the experienced players who are going to probably spend more money in, in most cases. Now to get to the other part of Melanie's comment about recommendations for easier RPGs. Now my number one strongest recommendation is Mermaid Adventures, but only if you can find a copy of the first edition, first printing version. This is a standalone book, a standalone role-playing game, and not the version of this is a PIP system source book. And I apologize for confusing you mentoring two different versions of a game. But if you can find that, that is my strongest recommendation. That's actually what I used for my kids that I loved. 
I it was such a great introduction. Really simple D6 based system. Actually, you'll find it familiar to Magical Kitties. Actually, some of the the systems there, but totally walks you through how to tell a story and gives you, I think, six different starting scenarios there. So it's like six versions of the comic book or whatever without you having to do any work. I also hear that Hero Kids and Tales of Adventure are great, as is No Thank You Evil. Now, I admit, by the time I learned about those, my girls have already moved on to more advanced RPGs, so I haven't tried these myself, but I have seen many, many people recommend these. Uh, I'd also add Amazing Tales in on that list for new gamer, gamers and families as well, uh, as I've been introduced to the superhero version of Amazing Tales, and the... I, I know that part one has definitely been written very well yeah. for the beginner. Awesome. Uh, next, a comment from longtime fan of the show and Windsor native game designer, Roger Malosh. Just caught your latest podcast about Prime Day AMA, and I would mm -hmm. love to have listened live, if only just to tease you about mechanism mechanic debate. Mo, you're the only person I know who pronounces Grognard correctly and doesn't pronounce the silent K in Renier Nitzia's name. Given that you are such a stickler for pronunciation, I'm confused as to why you would resort to the slang term for a game mechanism. It just ain't right. But <laughs> to each his own as long as we're all having fun. Now, I agree that the cube tower is not a mechanism. Neither is die or card on its own. Don Norman, who wrote The Design of Everyday Things, would likely describe these as affordances, similar to a door handle or a button on a machine. This affordance, when it is combined with a game rule, becomes a mechanism, which accomplishes a certain task or moves the game forward. This is the closest I can come to a clear description of a mechanism. By the way, I think you might have implied that I was a grognard of sorts, being a relative newbie to board games, I would consider this a badge of honor. Thank you. But wait, there's more. <laughs> One crucial aspect of games not covered in all this talk about game mechanics, components, and rules is player behavior. We may like to think of ourselves as logical beings, but nothing can be further from the truth. I like to call these behavioral quirks and foibles psychomechanisms. One that we are all familiar with is loss aversion in which a player experiences disproportionately large loss when an item is taken from them. This might explain many players' disdain for take-that games. Another closely related psychomechanism is the endowment effect, in which a player ascribes an overly large value to an item in their possession, as opposed to one that they haven't acquired yet. This could explain our fascination with set collection games. Mm -hmm. There are many more of these psychomechanisms which come into play in board games, and I am currently trying to figure them all out. I would love to hear your thoughts on this underexplored realm of psychomechanics in board games. All right. Thank you for the detailed comment, Roger. Uh, that's pretty awesome. Uh, long, I admit, but I think worth hearing, actually. I'm glad you enjoyed that particular show. I, I, I do regret that you weren't there. Um, I'll keep my response brief here. Uh, we've actually kind of gone back and forth since he sent this. Um, first off, Roger, languages evolve. Well, mechanism may be the proper term, mechanics started being used for video game systems and the systems to make video games work, and it spread to board games, and is used by pretty much everyone except the biggest pundits um i generally use mechanic but i'll admit to me the two are interchangeable and me mechanism does slip in there now and then now the affordance thing is pretty interesting that's actually pretty cool i like the the idea that the bits that make up the game the physical components the stuff you interact with has a term the affordance of the game and the, the using those giving a rule to use those becomes a mechanic i dig that um that might actually lead to a further topic on board game affordances something to consider in the future now psycho mechanisms i don't know if i do a full episode on this one because i'm sorry to say i disagree with you here while player behavior will impact gameplay and trying to elicit specific player behaviors is definitely something designers try to do with their games. I don't see them at all as mechanisms of the game themselves. And yes, I used your term, Roger. These player feelings are something that can be caused by a mechanic or a combination of mechanisms. I'm just going to keep throwing them back and forth till everyone's confused. I don't think, like, no one uses these terms. No one says... 
oh, well, I played um, Splendor the other day, and that's a sunk cost fallacy game. Or, you know what is a great game is if you sit down and play Concordia because it's an amazing loss aversion game. Like, that's just not said. It's, it's, that doesn't define a game. Now, when talking mechanics, you may put something in the game as a trap, like something that you're going to, oh, take this thing. It's quick and easy and gives you lots of points because, you know, players suffer from, uh, I missed the term he called it, but the, the wanting to hoard things and valuing things they hold more. Or you might put in another mechanic that's like, oh, discard two or give someone else a point. And people are like, well, I'm not going to discard two because they're mine, right? So you can play to those psychologies, but you can't put them in the game. Like you can't say, when you draw this card, you must suffer from loss aversion. It just doesn't work. Now, again, I do think this may be a cool topic to talk about more in detail like possibly even a full episode on different psycho mechanisms i don't know if i'd use that term or not because they sounds kind of scary uh but like what mechanisms help create what responses or how you can use player psychology when designing games now the thing is i am not a game designer yes i have played thousands of games and have lots of game experience i except for a couple rpgs which is a totally different form of designing games I've not sat down and designed a board game and I do not feel I really have the expertise to do that topic justice. Now I know Roger already listens to this, but like when getting to this, you want to tune into things like the Ludology, Ludology podcast, um, or you want to like Eric's not Eric Summer. I'm drawing a blank on a name. I'm bad. Ludology podcast is a good example. Jeff Engelstein. You want to tune into Jeff Engelstein stuff. His entire family designs board games. He has a blog. He used to be the host for Ludology He's since moved on. That is like, these are experts that as a living, that's what they do is dive into the stuff. They're the ones that taught me terms like prisoner's dilemma and sunk cost fallacy. And that's where I learned about these things. So I think they'll do a better job than us, but I'm still going to throw it in the pile because it might be something we can dive into. All right. Well, next, how about some shorter comments on our topic of must have gaming accessories? Theodore Theory says i love my foldable foldable silicone bit bowls from bgg and play mats ken takas jr says i got a handmade wooden dice tower for games that have a lot of dice it's helpful and makes a nice sound when the dice travel to the bottom tray robert konigsberg interesting article i use the small plastic sampler cups you find at supermarkets i buy a hundred and keep some in boxes and some near the table well, thanks for the comments, all three of you. Uh, some great suggestions there. Though I got to admit, I still do prefer a dice tray to a dice tower. Um, if you want to know why, check out with episode 133 of our podcast. Well, next, a comment on our roll and moves topic. Christopher Lundgren. I don't hate roll and move. If it's fun is what matters to me. I love talisman. It's long, but still fun. Mm -hmm. Those that act like grognards and elitists and snobs need to just relax. It's not all bad or good all the time after all. So as we talked about in that episode, you are totally right. There are fun roll and move games and we highlighted a whole bunch of them and it's the fun that counts. Now, my only issue with this comment from Christopher is the derogatory use of the term Gronyard. I refuse to let Gronyard become a pejorative. It is a cool historic term that goes back to Napoleon's armies that for many, many years has indicated someone who's been in a lifelong gamer, who's been a gamer for a long time. Yes, some Gronyards are elitists and snobs, but that's just a vocal minority that I refuse to let ruin the term for the rest of us. I'm a Gronyard, Sean's a Gronyard. There are plenty of awesome people who have been at this for a long time that wear the term as a badge of honor. Though I do still thank you for the comment. Finally, we received a number of extensive comments on our Aventuria YouTube videos mm. from Andre Thanhauser, who's in Germany and a huge fan of the game and the Dark Eye, who has some inside info for us. Nice. First up on the Aventuria review itself. This is the best review about one of my favorite games. All points are included and well-structured. Awesome. As a German who has access to the content earlier, including the various crowdfundings, I can already tell you that the next German crowdfunding being delivered in autumn will put the game to a higher level because it adds two modules. Okay. One, the adventures will have a bigger story part, including actual decisions instead nice. of a linear story and tests before the actual fight takes place. 
This can take go from taking more time to search for information or directly hunt the enemy to decisions on which way to go. Some of the existing adventures, therefore, will have a special director's cut version. Peace. Now, the overall campaign will feel more like a legacy with leveling up heroes and scaling scenario okay. difficulty. There's going to be visiting random locations. A lot of the basic cards are going to have versions to upgrade with XP, Ooh. similar to Arkham Horror living card game. And there's going to be plenty of additional unique cards you can get in your reserve via encounters from which you can then decide to put some in your deck. Mm -hmm. So that's another step closer to real RPG while missing the soft part of RPG. True. Well, it's still an adventure card game. Yeah. The good thing compared to games with a strict long campaign, you can still play the adventures in any order and the other players can join and leave as they like. Nice. The difficulty of the scenario will just be determined by the average hero level. At the moment, it feels like something is missing with leveling up heroes. For example, improving skills feels a bit like cheating. <laughs> The next crowdfunding content is going to fix that if you find the time to start playing the same hero for a long time instead of just trying them all out. Yeah. So you need to pass that entry level to play the real campaign mode. While you could still pl play the first module, Epic Story Mode, without the other modules by for and vice versa. Yeah. So then they continue with a follow-up. Okay. <laughs> I have to add, in my opinion, the deck's rules and mechanics don't offer enough depth to get that game only for the dueling mode. Yeah. You need to be aware of the rolling dice for almost everything, including the very random number of damage points you inflict. Does not make for a tense duel in which actually the better player mostly wins. There. In the end of the game, when the heroes are equipped to the maximum, one or two good or bad die rolls can easily decide mm -hmm. the match. Well, this doesn't bother me at all when it comes to the adventure mode. In fact, it makes for a tense and exciting gameplay and quite often, good and bad rolls even out over the course of the game. So don't get it when you just want to play competitively. True. <laughs> now, finally, they left a comment about the Arsenal of Heroes expansion, which said, I bought that box even though I mostly play the adventure mode and use dual mode just to teach new players the game, which we talked about during our review. Yeah. It helps with the dilemma of how to organize your cards, when on the one hand, you have created your own decks, but on the other hand, you still want to be able to use those basic decks to teach the game to new players. Mm -hmm. So they, they go on to talk about how it's been a sort of a life design and Ulysses themselves has realized and declared that Aventuria is not the competitive game they wished it to, would mm -hmm. be. And following expansions are really only focused on the adventure mode. Wow. Uh, thanks for all the info, Andre. Um, I'm glad you enjoyed the review. I, I like that quote, the, the best review of Aventuria. I'm, I'll take that. I'll take that accolade. I'm, I'm happy with that. Um, I love what we're hearing here about the game becoming more RPG-like with a better progression system, campaign play, and most importantly to me, actual decisions to be made during the story part. Not just rolling some dice, maybe getting some benefits or some boons or some penalties before you start the fight. It was just something leading up to the fight that was neat. Like, it was cool to hear the story, but like, you, you made no impact. There was no RPG element there. I like that. And I love the fact that they're actually going to rework the existing adventures to do the, what do you call it, designer's edition, I think you mentioned, um, to get those put into the ones I've already played. That is cool. All I'm worried about is that this stuff makes it over here. This is the next German Kickstarter. So I'm kind of hoping they do in English at the same time, but I don't know. Now, it's also interesting to hear competitive play and dueling didn't actually take off anywhere. Um, remember, this isn't a new game, right? So this isn't the fact that, oh, there's not enough organized play due to the pandemic, so it didn't take off. This game came out in 2016. There's been plenty of time for it to take off. It just didn't prove as popular as the, the publisher thought. I don't have much more to say on that, except for the fact that we didn't dig dueling all that much either. So again, I do the same thing. I only use it for teaching the game, just to show people how the cards work. Now, finally, Arsenal of Heroes, I completely agree. Um, this product shouldn't exist. It, it should have been broken up and sold separately. Um, I should have either been able to pick up just all the hero cards or maybe even just the hero cards for one deck. Like if I wanted the cards out of one deck, I'd just buy the, the Dwarf Blacksmith deck. And the dice should have been an add-on. Like, they were neat, they're nice to have, but I didn't want to have to pay for them to get these extra cards, right? Let Sell me an add-on that's either just the D20s or just the D6s or all together. And then, like, the stuff that's in the book are four new player builds and tournament rules. Well, 
they've done two printings of the core game. Why weren't these just tossed in the core game rule book? To me, that just belonged in the base box. Or throw it in whatever, the next expansion. It should have been in Forest of No Return, or it should have been in a later expansion, in my opinion. Or just be free online. Like, do people really need a physical book to give you a different list of cards to put in your deck? Like, haven't been people been deck, what do they call them, net decks and magic for years now? Like, I don't know. Or even... Games Workshop does this all the time. Put out a little pamphlet and send it to local game stores to sell a venture and they hand them out. It, it's promotional material. It might even get people to pick up the game. Anyway, I still stand by the comment we made when we reviewed this. I have a hard time recommending this rather expensive box to anyone. Unless you really love that dual mode. Uh, like even character building when you're playing with a, a cooperative, maybe you might want it, but it's a rough sell. Well, that's it for this week's comments and suggestions. Send your feedback to tabletop mo to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. <laughs> A couple of announcements before we move on to our main topic. At the time of this recording, Wednesday, July the 14th, there is one week left in our space space giveaway. If you're listening to this on your podcatcher, the day it drops, you've got today and tomorrow to enter. Remember, this is thanks to the NHMGS. This giveaway is open worldwide. Just head over to the blog to enter. I will also toss a link um, in the show notes, and there is going to be a link on the blog to find it, because now I post a bunch of other stuff, and it's kind of scrolled down the page. You may not be able to find it. But if you go to the top corner of the webpage, the spot that says Tabletop Gaming Deals, just mouse over that. You'll find a link to the giveaway. Now, Deanna pointed out something that I almost missed and went right past. Um, it is hard to believe, but we are coming up on our three-year anniversary of the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast. While our actual anniversary is the 26th, we're going to be celebrating on our live show on the 28th. And that is the last Wednesday of July. Now, for that show, uh, we're going to do a live AMA. For anyone who wants to stop by, we'll answer questions. These don't have to be gaming related. This is the show. If you really want to ask something silly and stupid, it's probably the one to do it. Not that any questions are stupid. Um, we're probably going to do a little bit of recap where we were, where we are now, how many downloads, I don't know, how many games we played in the last year. The, the usual kind of things you expect for an anniversary episode. And I just remembered earlier what we did last year, and I think we're going to do that again so you may want to stick around till the end of the show for a bit of a party well while we hope that you join us every week it would yes. be awesome to see a packed lobby for this anniversary episode we're here to answer your game gaming or game night questions tonight's question is something unique and new now this question didn't come through our website or at questions at tabletopbellhop.com email, or even any of our social media accounts. This one actually came through my at tabletop underscore deals Twitter account, where I share the best board game deals from all over the web. Now, Uncle Rico writes, at tabletop underscore deals, any good word-based party game recommendations? I love Decrypto. This was, of course, a comment on a sale post about Decrypto. Yeah, I'll take it. You know what? Back when our, our, our podcast segues used to be a bit longer, we kind of condensed the show down so we get to the monkey a little quicker. I used to say something to the extent of, I'll take your gaming questions anywhere. And that's still true. I'm all for people asking Big Dude Likes Food, my food port account for game suggestions too. I mean, you post enough pizza pics, I wouldn't at all uh, be surprised to see some New York Slice questions pop yeah. up, or perhaps some more unlabeled questions with your craft beer reviews. Um, I'm all for it. You want, you want, we're going to play some Sushi Go, we can talk about the best sushi. Or the other way around, you want to talk about the best sushi game, I'll tell you about the best sushi game. All right, so on to Uncle Rico's question. I do dig it, though. I like, I like that it came in from an unusual source there. So, word-based party games, eh? That's, that's what we're looking for, Rico. Um, I don't think we need a lengthy talk about what that means. Often when we're like, we're going to do train games, we just sit here and debate what a train game is. I think this is pretty, pretty self-explanatory. But just in case, I do want to explain, I limited my game picks tonight to games that involve words in some way. So there's a mix of word guessing games, spelling games, clue giving, guess the word style games. So I didn't limit to like just games where you have to spell or just games where you have to word. Sometimes you got to write down words. Sometimes you got to guess clues. I also 
specifically pit games at a higher player count. I wanted party games, big groups. To me, party meant a lot of people, not just fun. So, for example, a little wordy. We reviewed this recently. I think this is a great, quick filler word game from uh, the people that brought you Exploding Kittens, their first real strategy game, but it's two-player only. So it didn't hit the list tonight. Not even in honorable mentions. Throw out a little wordy. Doesn't apply. I also specifically looked for games that were social, that got people uh, interacting and having fun together. Like, well, Scrabble may be the world's most popular word game. Staring at letters and looking at a board, trying to maximize your points isn't what I'd call a party. And to be fair, what I saw when I was Googling today listed as the most popular party game we don't support here at Bellhop's Tabletop. And also, I don't really consider it a word game. So <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, I, it is going to the, the there is a tie in in our honorable mentions. I think it's in our honorable mention. Maybe it's in the main list. No, it's in the, main, it's in the main list. Oh, it's in the main list. So there is a tie-in to the most popular game. And that <sighs> is one I was a little iffy on. But we'll get to that in just a second, because I want to start off with... Oh, wait, wait. One more thing I do want to point out. I am not a huge word game fan. So we don't own a lot. Now, my wife digs word game fans, so we don't own some. But we do not have a huge collection of word games unlike some other categories i really do enjoy um so today's list is going to feature a larger than usual number of honorable mentions as usual this list is in no particular order all right number one is code names uh this is one case where i am actually going to recommend code names and not code names to it almost every game recommendation we get to list we get to and someone wants us to put code names on the list or i want to put it i i almost always recommend do it now, Duet works great as a team game. It's a fantastic two-player game, but it also works good with teams of two or three players. But after that, it falls apart. Once you get to the higher player counts, you want the original code names, uh, possibly some variant of the original code names. This is a game you can really play. I don't know what it says in the box, but with any number of people, as long as everyone can gather around and see the board in some way. And they even make a deluxe version or an uh, extra large version to facilitate that. I have seen a 30 person player, 30 player game of code names with 15 per side. It does work. Now, for those of you who don't know the game, this is a team-based word guessing game where code givers are trying to get members of their team to guess specific words on a grid of cards on the table before the other team guesses their words on the table, with both teams trying to avoid the dreaded assassin, which eliminates your team if they guess it. That's the very quick summary. And that was Code Names. <laughs> Next, I have Letter Jam. Now, when working on this list, I got to admit, I wasn't sure if I was going to include Letter Jam or not, uh, based on what I just said I limited my list down to. Um, once I realized just how few word games I actually own, I decided to include it, despite the fact that this can be rather thinky and maybe isn't the, the, the raucous party game as some of the other games on this list. And it does only play up to six players. Now, this is a mix of spelling and word guessing game in one with deduction aspects. In this cooperative game, players can't see their own letter cards. And each round, someone gives a clue, and players try to guess the word that clue is using the letters they can see, only knowing what order the letters they go in, including the one they can't see. They attempt to use this info to guess what their personal letters are. Now, at the end of the game, if everyone can spell a word with their letters, you all win. Now, you played this one, so I, is that an app description? Trap Words is not, or sorry, Letter Jam is not an easy game to describe, but I think that kind of covers it. Yeah, no, I think that covers it. Uh, it. It is definitely a game that should be experienced uh, yes. but more, than, more than heard about. <clears throat> Fair enough. And that was Letter Jam. And you caught that slip. I just said Trap Words. That's because I was looking down the page, and that's the next one on the list. Uh, this is another Team-based game, right? Split up, uh, kind of like code names, with a dungeon crawl theme. Players advance through the dungeon by getting their teammates to guess the right word. The twist is that the other team gets to set a number of traps or trap words. If you use one of these words, the trap goes off and you fail to advance. Along with this is a system of curses that act as a catch-up mechanic and end-game boss fights with additional limitations added to the play on what can be guessed or what you have to do or what clues you can get. If your team manages to get to the boss monster and defeat them before the other team does, you win. And that was Trap Words.
Now, those are pretty hobby game like, right? Like code names are starting to spread everywhere, but let's go to a classic. This is a game from the 1980s. I think it's 84, and that is Balderdash. This is a game that is still a lot of fun today. This is a game where everyone gets an obscure word and then has to write down their own definition of that word. Then everything's shuffled up and players vote for the definition they think is correct, including a card that has the actual dictionary definition. Now, there is one aspect of this game I do not like. There is a meta game here that you can learn. You have to learn to make your definitions sound like Balderdash definitions, if that makes sense, like whatever dictionary they used. And you're going to do way better than everyone else if you can at least make your sound it because the, the official definition always kind of sticks out as sounding like an official definition. So there is a meta game there. But once you get past that, it's a really sweet game. Though I do have to say this is very vocabulary based, so it's not going to work all that great with younger kids or with people with limited vo vocabularies. Though I've got to say playing with kids, you'll probably laugh your butts off at what they come up with, though you may never think they're the proper answers. I still have fun playing Balderdash. It, it is a solid game. Absolutely. Balderdash has been around for ages. Uh, I actually love the new box cover they've got. I uh, I didn't recognize it as Balderdash. They, they've really gone for a more artistic uh, design lately. And yep. uh, on that was Balderdash. Actually, it's cool to know it's still in print. I assumed it was, but I hadn't actually seeked it out. Set, sought it out? I hadn't actually sought it out. All right, next. When I started making this list, uh, I almost didn't think of this game because... I didn't think Bananagrams was a high player count game. In my head, Bananagrams is something I play with my wife. This is like a two player game. And I think I remember playing at the local game store with like three or four. I had no clue that Bananagrams played eight players. Like I totally missed that fact and all the times I've seen the game. Now I will admit this is a solid game. Like Bananagram is a great game. It's really fast, rapid. Everyone plays at the same time, trying to grab word tiles and spell out uh, Scrabble like crossword stuff. But I have to admit, I didn't try it with this many players. I do like it with a low player count. And the fact that this showed up on many other people's best party game lists, I got to say this would be a good one for a party. I just haven't tried it myself, but Bananagrams is a win as far as a word game goes. Just haven't tried it with the full eight players. And that was Bananagrams. <laughs> Next, I have another classic game. I don't know what's older between this and Balderdash, but Taboo. Now, this is obviously the game CGE or whoever the designer of uh, Trap Words was looking at when they made it. Like, personally, I'll admit, I'd rather play Trap Words. Trap Words is a little more involved, a bit more of a Euro game, and it has that cool dungeon theme. But I can't discredit Taboo as a great word game. Now, where Taboo differs from Trap Words is that the words you can't use are on the clue card. So the clue giver has something they need you to say, and then they have a list of five words that they can't use to get you to say it. And if they say one of those words, they, they get eliminated. And it's another team-based one where you're talking to your team, the other team's talking to theirs. And then the other team gets to see those, those taboo words and calls you out when you screw it up. I think this is a great game. Personally, I would rather go with trap words. To me, that's more thematic. But if you've got, especially if you're playing with non-gamers or family, you might want to just stick to the original taboo. I cannot believe every time I play this, how hard it is to not use those taboo words. Like whoever sat down and did the, the mental math of figuring out, you know, you want to say the word pill, but like medicine, jar, and like, like whoever came up with those five things you can't say is brilliant. And that was taboo. Next is one of my favorite games on the list tonight. One I strongly recommend picking up, even if it's not just for playing party games. And that is medium. Now I will say, this plays up to eight, and I actually prefer this at the lower player counts. Uh, the problem with medium is downtime between turns because you're going to pair off with the partner to your left, and then you're going to guess up to three words, and that can take a little while. And then it has to go to the next pair and the next pair and the next pair. So once you're up to eight players, this can get slow. Now, if you're playing a nice casual game night where people are wandering around and chatting, this is the kind of thing that'll work where you can kind of wander around for the table and come back when it's your turn. Though it is often enjoyable to watch other people play. Now, this is a game where players have hands of cards and choose one card to play face up in front of them with a partner who also plays a word. Then both players try to make a psychic connection and say the word that's the medium, the, the, the thing that's common between two words on those two face up cards. They go one, two, three, say their word. If they get it right, they get some points. If they fail, they then try again. But this time they have to use the words they just said. 
again. If they get it right, they get some points. Then if they fail again, they get one more try. And then it just goes around the table. There's a timing mechanism. Whoever has the most points wins. Really solid game, though, I said, have something else for players to do once you get to higher player counts. And that was medium. Next is the most gimmicky, toyerific, kind of silly looking game on this list, and that is Tapple. I don't know how to describe this thing. Like, it's like a Frisbee with letters on the edges. It's this rather large disc-shaped thing with a red switch thing in the middle and a number, a bunch of switches on the outside, and these switches all have letters on them. Um, they're not the full alphabet, but it's some of them. Now, a category is drawn from a deck, and it'll say uh, types of fish or something, right? I honestly, every time I play this game, we throw out the deck, and we just come up with some of our own geeky things. Like, trust me, Tapple is way more fun when you go, you have to name Star Trek alien species. At least in my opinion, it's more fun. Then you you turn the game on. You like push this switch on it. It starts counting down. You don't see it. And the game becomes hot potato. You pass the tapple to someone. They have to say a Star Trek alien or whatever your category is and hit the letter that that Star Trek alien starts. And then they pass it to the next player and they say Vulcans and hit the V. And then they pass it. So it's Klingons. It hits the K and eventually it like buzzes. Then when it buzzes, the person who's holding the thing is eliminated. I This game is way more fun than it has any right to be. This is one Sean needs to play at an extra light, but I don't own a copy. I need to get John Salilo to bring his copy out because he's the one that introduced me to this game. Simple, gimmicky, over the top, but so much fun. And that was Tapple. Next, I have Nitwit. This is a two to eight player word game that to me is Venn diagram the board game. Now at the start of each round, you're going to put down a spool and then you put a string around it. You attach a word to that string. And you don't pick the word, you draw it randomly. Then the next person puts down a spool and puts a rope out and they have to cover their spool, but nothing else. But they could cover the first one. And you keep doing this until there's like eight spools out with all these strings around. Then players have to look at the spool, see what it's surrounded by, which words are it surrounded by, and then come up with a word that fits all those words that it's surrounded by. And I got to say, this is harder to describe in words than it should be. Like if I showed you this in person, you get it right away. It just makes perfect sense. Now, while this one isn't really high rated, I did not see this recommended by many people, and it's actually bargain basement prices all the time. So I don't know why this didn't take off. I love this game. I love trying to come up with words that fit multiple incongruous categories, like cute purple and sharp. Well, that was nitwit. I was hoping Sean would come up with something cute purple and sharp. No, I'm not. Not even... (laughs) <laughs> I was hoping it didn't happen. I dig that game. Uh, next, I have the one we alluded to earlier. That is apples to apples. I'll admit, I, is it a word game? Uh, the, the one cards are single words, and then there's not single words. I, I decided to include it. Again, number of games that word games I played is a fairly small list, and I'm only taking the top. So apples to apples, you draw a random description card. This is a word, right? This is a descriptor, something that's described. Then every player secretly chooses a thing card from their hand that matches that description. So it might say fuzzy, and then you're going to play things. And then the active player then picks the one they think is the best pairing. So like with fuzzy, you've got blanket, doll, and apple. And then part of the game is everyone go, why the hell did you put apple? And they're like, well, when it goes moldy, they go fuzzy. And you're like, oh, okay, that was a stretch. That's a big part of apple, apples to apples. Now, the classic game, this game has kind of exploded, right? This has inspired so many knockoffs and variants, including almost all of the popular white text on black background party games, many of which are not safe for work. I personally have had way more fun with the original apples to apples where not safe for work connections are implied and not overt and thrown in your face. And that is our uh, love of party game apples to apples and not the black and white card version. Yes. The, the black text on or white text on black cards and black text on white cards games. There are many. Uh, My final one tonight, I know shorter list than usual, is Train of Thought. Uh, This is a really unique game that that requires an interesting, like your brain works in a neat way playing this. You're going to get, the the person giving the clues gets two cards. And they have different numbers on, one to six. You're going to roll a die, and you're going to look up that number on both cards. One of those cards is face up, so everyone can see it. The other one, you hide. You then look at the two clues with that number, and you need to make a connection. Uh, and you are going to try to make a train of clues 
from the word on the face up card to the word on your hand in your hand. Now, this is done by giving a three word clue. Now, your first three word clue has to include that face up word. But then your clues going forward have to be based on the people's guesses. So you give your first clue and people give you single word clues. Your next three word clue has to be based on one of the clues the person said. And then they're going to guess again. And then you have to base that off one they said. And then you're going to keep doing that, building a train of thought to hopefully the word in your hand before time runs up. I think this is a really neat one just because it makes you think in an interesting way. It, it makes you, it, you play very different from other word games. It's all about making the connections between the words, not only just the words on the table and the one in the hand, but what people are saying and integrating that into your train. So you can actually make a real six degrees of separation between Bacon yes. and Kevin. <laughs> that is true. And that was Train of Thought. All right, on to our honorable mentions. As usual, honorable mentions are games I did not put on the main list for one reason or another, and every single one of these games is because I have not played them yet. So these are great sounding word games that I have not had the pleasure to play, games that have come up on other people's recommendation lists, or games that I just saw while doing research on word games that went, that sounds really neat. So the first one is, of course, just one. One of these days, I am going to get a copy of just one or I'm going to get to play a copy of just one. So I don't have to keep putting it. And it seems like every honorable mention game recommendation we episode, we do. When we talk about filler games, I mentioned just one. We talk about word games. I honorable mention just one. We talk about short games that are easy to learn. I mentioned just one. And I still haven't played it. This game sounds great. Um, I've heard pretty much all positive things about this game. Uh, this is a party game where one player is trying to guess a word. Everyone else is giving clues with the trick being that each clue given has to be unique. If two players give the same clue, they cancel out and the clue giver doesn't. They're, so the guesser doesn't get to hear the clue. Uh, it just sounds great. This sounds dead easy. Um, sounds simple to learn. Now, I have heard uh, actually from one of our Patreon patrons that this does not work that great when playing with younger kids, uh, mostly due to them having a vocab more limited voc vocabulary, as well as sticking to like really simple, easily repeated clues. So they'd say the same thing, like you say red, and both kids just automatically say apple or hot or something like that. I just one sounds fantastic, and like, I feel bad that I haven't played it. Now, part of that's a pandemic. I have a feeling if we didn't hit a pandemic, I would have given you a, probably a full review on just one, and I'm pretty sure it belonged on the full list. Uh, and to be fair, that uh, that patron did have more fun with their family in just one today, and so part of it might have been exhaustion from uh, all the fun they were having before they got to just one. Oh, there you go. It, it, I guess you need some energy to play just one. <laughs> Next, I have Decrypto. Now, when this game hit the market at cons, I can't remember if it was Origins or Gen Con, wherever packs, whatever, wherever it hit, man, there was a lot of buzz, like ton. It was one of those every podcast was talking about Decrypto. Every time anyone brought up party games, we were like, oh, have you played your crypto yet? It was huge. And unlike many of the games, um, the buzz hasn't completely died down. I still see people talking about how much they love to pick Decrypto. Now, this quick party game takes up to eight players who are broken into teams. Each round, one player on the team is trying to pass on a secret code to their partners with the opponents getting a chance to potentially intercept that code between rounds. So this is done using like um, the old Transformers thing with the red sheets that go over a word to be able to see your word. As far as I can tell, it doesn't actually serve any purpose in the game except to be neat. And then you're trying to get your, po your people to guess your words in a certain order based on a clue card. And then if you fail, your opponent's team then has gotten to listen to you this whole time, right? So they've gotten to hear the clues and, and the words. They then get a guess to see if they get the code right. And then if they're wrong, you get to play another round and it keeps going back and forth. And the neat part is this is simultaneous. So while you're playing, like someone on your team kind of has to be listening in on the other team. Sounds really neat. I would love to try this one out. This, this I need to sit down and play to, to give a final verdict on, but it sounds really cool. And uh, I mentioned the chat room with uh, you can play that more than eight, much like code names. Oh, OK, the box said or board game geek said up to eight. So fair yeah. enough. Yeah. That's actually even better. And that was Decrypto. All right. Next is where words <laughs> longtime fans of the show should know why I haven't played this one myself. Um, this is a word guessing game based on the social deduction party game werewolf or otherwise known as mafia. Um, I, I am not a fan of those two games. Now, Where Words is basically a game of 20 questions 
where one of the players is a werewolf and who knows the answer and is trying to mislead the other players. So they're asking, you know, misleading questions or whatever. They're not the ones saying yes or no, but like they're going to ask dumb questions, to try to mislead people. Dumb again being the wrong word. Sorry. They're going to they're going to they're gonna ask misleading questions. Now, the neat bit here is if they don't get the answer in 20 questions, the the players, the heroes get one last chance to identify the werewolf. And if they identify the werewolf, they still win. And I got to say, you know what? I should give this a shot. Like, like just doing my research, my actual due diligence this time and reading how to play werewords, actually watched the how to play video. I was like, okay, that doesn't seem so bad. It, it honestly sounds quite different from werewolf or mafia. I may actually enjoy this. This doesn't involve outright lying to people like, Oh no, I'm a, I'm not a werewolf. You aren't doing that in this game. Well, as far as I can tell, it's the, the, the actual, the, the actual play I saw didn't have that. It was more people just talking about, uh, like I said, misleading clues and not, Oh, are you the werewolf? No, you're not. The, we remember three rounds ago when you did this, or, or you gave him the side eye. And you don't have the problems of a moderator and people closing their eyes and opening their eyes. I should give it a shot. I'll admit, I'll try it. I'm not going to rush out and buy it blind, but if someone locally has it, I'll finally, if I go to QCC, Sean Gilgore, are you listening? I'll play Werewords next time. And that was Werewords. <laughs> next, I have Spell Smashers. As implied by this name, this is another word spelling game where you're going to combine letter cards in your hand to spell words. Now, what's neat about this is it's supposed to be based on JRPGs and the words you're spelling are used to battle monsters and acquire treasure and do damage. Every time you damage a monster, you get coins that you can spend when you go to town. And if you manage to defeat a monster, you get another letter card so you can build bigger words in the future rounds. Between rounds, there's a whole system for going shopping in town. I don't even know what you buy or what you do with it, but this just sounds fun. This sounds neat. It sounds thematic. Now, without having played it, I can't tell you how much of a party element it has. Now, it does say it's only playable to five players. So this one falls in honor mention for two reasons. One, I didn't play it. And two, I'm not sure if it's really a party game. It might be more involved than it looks. But I guess it sounds cool. I want to play this game. This just sounds awesome. Well, that was Spell Smashers. <laughs> Next, I have When I Dream. Well, this does have the same player count issue with, um, sorry, doesn't have the same player count issue as a spell spanner. This plays up to 10 and it does say it's under 40 minutes. I'm not sure this is a party game. This sounds really unique. This is one of the most unique. This is the most unique game on this list. Well, I don't know. Tapple might count for totally different reasons. This is a pretty unique game. So each round, one player is a dreamer who puts on a sleep mask so they can't see. The other players are playing spirits and there's like three factions of spirits. There's like happy spirits and naughty spirits and trickster spirits can switch teams. I don't, I don't quite get how that works having not played the game, but then the spirits are going to draw dream cards and they're going to give one word clues describing the card they have. So here's where the word game part comes in. Now the dreamer tries to guess what dream element that represents and based on if they're right or wrong, the cards go into two different piles. Again, that, that has to do with the trickster and happy spirit thing. Now, that sounds interesting enough on its own, but then at the end of the round, the person who was the dreamer then has to tell a story using all the words they said through their dream and turn it and, and tell everyone the dream, like an actual improv RPG element. Then they take their eyes off. And I got to say, this sounds really neat but doesn't really make any sense reading about it. And even I watched the, uh, like a how to play, but the how to play didn't like, was very mechanical. This seems like it would make a lot more sense in person. And I got to say it, I like the combination of word guessing and an RPG storytelling element. Like here's the word game. I want to play with Jeff and Sheila. Uh, apparently there's also a traitor in when I dream. Yeah, that's the whole thing with the spirits, right? Like there, there's there's trickster spirits and there's something with the spirits where they're giving misleading clues. That's the part of the game I didn't quite get just being able to read about it. And like I said, I did watch a how to play, but it was very mechanical. So it was a little confusing. All right. And that was When I Dream. All right. Here's my last one. Word on the street. We've mentioned this one before. This is a lightning quick team game 
where there's a street, a board with a street. I don't know how many lanes there are, but the, the amount of lanes would definitely affect the difficulty. But the median in the middle has most of the English consonants. Not all of them, but most of them. Like J's missing, or I don't even know what's missing. Some are mi Q is not there. I know Q's not there for sure. I think V might be missing an X. But anyway, there's a bunch of consonants. Each round, team's given a category. Now, again, what I recommend for this game and what I've heard makes it more fun is toss out the category cards and use your own say Star Wars planets or something more interesting than, than types of fish. And then you set a timer. And then for each word you're able to say before the timer runs out, you can move the letters in that word one step closer. Now, if the letters in the word more than once, you still only move one step, but you can move all of the consonants that are in your words towards your side of the street. And then the round ends and the next team gets to do it. And you get this tug of war with the letters going back and forth. Now, if you do manage to get a letter off the board, you get to claim it. And the first team to claim eight letters to their own side wins the game. And that's it. I really dig the concept of this. Ever, I don't remember what episode I first saw, discovered this game, but it sounds fantastic. The only thing I want to see is if there's some timing rules, because it sounds like lots of hands trying to move things at once to me. And I, I have to assume there's something there to mitigate that. But this sounds like a great party game where you've got a table, like you're, you're, you're sitting at a table playing, not, you know, acting out stuff or, or just yelling at each other. And that was Word on the Street. That's it for our list of best word-based party games. Now, before we move on, I do want to point people to episode 75 of our podcast. This was titled, Can I Have a Word? And what we talked about there was our favorite word games. Now, this was word games overall, without the focus on party games. So there are games there we did not mention tonight, like Hardback and Letter Tycoon, which I think are fantastic, uh, like heavier uh, designer games, right? More gamer games than, than some of these lighter games. You can also check out our 18 of the best word-based board games article on the blog. As usual, link in the show notes. Now, remember, if you've got a game or game night question for us, all you got to do is head over to the website and click on Ask the Bellhop. Now, let's head over to the lobby and see what they have to add. All right, lobbyists, you have been busy tonight. Yes, the lobby it's been was awesome. Fantastic. I was trying, there were some there. I was trying to decide if I interject or not. And I'm like, <laughs> no, I'm just going to go with it. We're just going to, we're going to stream through this and then we'll get to all your suggestions after. So I'm going to start scrolling back. I see Brilligerent. Thanks for joining us. It's the first time I've seen you in our chat room and it's always welcome to have new people talking about Time's Up is a favorite in their group. Time's up. That is not. Once I see it, I'll know it. I and BGG it. is back up, so you can do, you can check it now. Um, uh, there was also a little yeah, bit of discussion. You know about, what? You know what I know about Time's Up? It's always on sale. That's right. all I can tell you. And it has an awesome, um, instead of an hourglass, it's little beads that spin down. Right. To be honest, that's all I know. I know nothing else about Time's uh, Up. Hardback did come up, and we addressed uh, that at the end there. Yeah, we that, love that game. It's just not really a party game. No, there, there, there is no party aspect to yeah. <laughs> None at all. The, it is the anti-party game. Uh, we've it's got the, so very so very wrong about games mentioning The Chameleon. I, I know Jeff Seuss really digs that game. That's one I have not played. Um, I was concerned when it first came out that I thought it was one of those um, black text on white cards and white text on black cards kind of games. Right. Though I've since learned it's not. Um, that is a, a hidden role social deduction element. So I, I, again, I am not a fan of that type of game. So that may be one reason why I would stay away from that one. Personally, I have heard good things, but it didn't make my list. Cause I, I am not a fan of hidden trailer, hidden element games. All right. Well, uh, some lot of love for decrypto out there. Yeah. Uh, and just one as well. Nitwit did not, was not enjoyed by, uh, by religion. Oh, that's um, too bad. I, so, I guess people, I don't know. I really liked Nitwit. Uh, let me see here. Uh, if you have some folks on a Zoom night, High Clue, H-A-I-C-L-U-E, is on Board Game Arena for fun. A nice little word game. Oh, that is not one I have heard of. Uh, and yeah, so that, that one is on Board Game Arena available. Uh, we've got... Uh, I also, had a bunch from Ryan here. Yep. Yeah, uh, unspeakable words, words. I am not a fan of that game. 
I, I do not like it. I do not actually uh, enjoy unspeakable words. Um, it's too chaotic and it fits the theme. It's all about spelling stuff for Cthulhu. So the whole thing in that game is the points on the letters are based on how many angles they have, which is kind of amusing because it's arbitrary. Um, but there's always, there's, there's a rule there where after spelling a word, you have to roll a D20. And if you roll, you have to roll less than the number of, no, because the more the more letters you use the heart, the bigger risk you have. So you have to try to roll higher than whatever your word is. And if you don't, you have to take a little Cthulhu statue or you lose one. I can't remember if you take them or lose them. And if you have too many, you're out of the game. But when you're on your, you lose them. Because when you're on your last Cthulhu statue, you can then go full on cultist and spell any word you want. The only rule is that you have to try to pronounce it. And you can literally mix the letters however you want. The combination of the dice rolls and it, it's just, it's random arbitrary fun. And like, I, I don't like playing word games with my wife sometimes because her vocabulary is better, but I do like that to count for something <laughs> as opposed to just whoever rolled better winning the game. Although I got to say that does sound like a 2 a.m. Uh, extra life game. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> I, I can I, I can totally see myself and or Tori trying to pronounce. Oh, that, that last part's awesome. That, that yeah, last yeah. rule, I, I love that rule. That rule's great. But the the rest of the game, like I said, the whole arbitrary, like eyes are worth one point, but for some reason you want to use as E's, I think are worth the most. Whereas E's one of the most common words in the English language. Like it's just, it, it's irrational, which again, fits the theme well, but not my fan, not a fan. Uh, also, he mentions uh, uh, word Z. Why do I know that one? I can't remember what. I know the name. I can't picture it. I can't picture it. Uh, the great podcast here as I look up stuff. <laughs> uh, he also mentioned. Oh, it's up- newer. 2017. Okay. I don't know words. I have not played it. What a nice looking cover. That right. looks like it might be one of those not a party game. No, 20 minutes, six players. Okay. Uh, also, uh, Upwards, which again, love no. the game, not a party game. Yeah, uh, letter letter ty- letter tycoon. Same thing. Same thing, and paperback hardback. Again, we've already yeah. addressed that Same one. Thing. Those are those are sort of all shifting across that party line into into yeah. game nine and uh, into word based games. Now, so very wrong about grain says you play just one, but use code name cards and pads of paper. Okay, like all I'd have to do is download the rules. Yeah, the game's supposed to be so good. I just kind of want to play it as like it's intended. But yeah, that would work. Yeah. Well, that's like earlier tonight. It's kind of amusing. Um, I had uh, Grace try to bring up the games for our backdrop, and they couldn't find code names. And well, it's because I combined duet and code names in one box because the uh, clues are interchangeable. Right. And it's all in my duet box because I, as I mentioned, I actually prefer duet as a game. Uh, so very wrong about games was 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 playing along and, and somehow get, staying a step ahead of us at one point where yeah, you know, calling that. out calling out the games that we were about to talk about. That was impressive. <laughs> Uh, um, they'd be really good at medium, and there they'd we go. Really there we go. Over play some medium, Kevin. Kevin's, uh, our how about boggle again? Not a party game to me. I don't know. I mean, it was kind of, I, I remember playing with, with like large groups of people in grade really? school. Oh, um, see, I, I don't think of boggle as a party game myself. To me, that's a, a thinky you don't speak, you don't socialize, you just write down words, and then you get frustrated because someone else guessed your words, then you do a bunch of math. To me, that doesn't sound like a party, but right. And I've never played with like more than four people. Boggle is loud. Yes, it is. Very yes, true. It is. All right. Oh, uh, that's what it was. So did I upload our note, my notes to the wrong thing? Did I put them on the um, Bridge City <laughs> Gamers uh, uh, Discord instead? Or not Discord, Drive instead of ours? Is there that what go. I did? I guess I wordsy looks neat. Letter Tycoon, I think Sean needs to play, but I don't actually own it. It, it went out of print and hard to find. Hard I've- after... The one, it. the one that was confusing me. We have talked about word on the street before because yes. you're describing it, and I'm like, why this game sounds super familiar, and I don't know why, but maybe, I, maybe it's from the episode 18 or whatever. Yeah, I'm pretty or sure it episode was episode 75 or whatever. Because I mean, I'm like, you're describing this. I'm like, yeah, why have we, we have. talked about this game? I like there, yeah. there is definitely some overlap here, right? Yeah, yeah, I know. Welcome to a look at World's Fair 1893 Second Edition. A big thank you to Renegade Game Studios for sending us a review copy of this new version of World's Fair for us to check out. So World's Fair 1893 was designed by J. Alex Kevern and features artwork by Adam P. McIver and Beth Sobel. 
This new printing of the game does add Jade R. Rogers, the founder of the House of Afros, Capes and Curls, as a historical consultant. Now, the original version of World's Fair 1893 was published in 2016 by Renegade Game Studios. Now, this new edition is also published by Renegade Game Studios and was released early in 2021 as an Amazon exclusive game. Now, this new edition of the game has a lowered MSRP of $40 US. Now, as a bit of backstory, the 1893 World's Fair was held in Chicago as the 400th anniversary of Columbus's voyage being the sort of overarching theme of the fair. And it was a vital aspect of showing that Chicago had more than just recovered after the fires a decade pri prior, but was a thriving metropolis. In addition, the Ferris wheel was invented for this event and this game does not let you forget that. As you can see on the image in the middle here between us. So in World Fair 1893, players take on the role of organizers of the fair competing for the best reputation. Now they're gonna earn this reputation by using their supporters to gain influences over the five areas of the show, which is manufacturing, electricity, fine arts, transportation, and agriculture. Now you're going to collect cards that will let you propose exhibits for each of these areas and use historical figures to affect your influence. Midway ticket sales will also affect your reputation, as will a variety of the, the variety of the approved proposals at the end of the game. Now the winner is the player with the most reputation after three rounds. To see what you get in this new edition of this classic area majority game, check out our World's Fair 1893 unboxing on YouTube. Now, the thing that shocked me the most upon opening this new edition of World's Fair is that it looks identical to the original game, like the, the inside of the box. The outside has a new cover, shiny new cover, but inside looked identical, like, like the same stuff. Uh, for some reason, I was under the mistaken impression that I was getting, getting a deluxe version. I, I thought this new printing was going to feature upgraded components in some way. I was surprised to learn that the only things that have changed is a new section of the rule book about the history of the World's Fair, specifically in reference to race, some new box art, and seven new influential figure cards. Other than these three small changes that have absolutely zero impact on the game's play, this new edition of World's Fair 1893 is identical to the 2016 printing. Which we must say is a solidly reviewed mm -hmm. and well-respected game to start with. Now, I will say for those who haven't seen the original, the components you do get in this game are great. Uh, you got lots of thick cardboard that's easy to punch, a bunch of wooden car cubes and five different colors. Cards are well-designed and well-finished that can deal with shuffling often. Rules are very clear and easy to learn the game from with lots of examples of gameplay featuring actual game components. And I do say the new historical note that was added is a welcome addition and is well-written. Now, for any of you listening who haven't played the original World's Fair 1893 game, we'll be summarizing how to play the game. For those of you who are just here to see what's new, feel free to skip over the next section of this review and jump to our thoughts on the game. And now on to that gameplay summary. So you start by building the board, featuring a central board showing the giant Ferris wheel surrounded by five randomized area boards, one for each of those areas I mentioned earlier of manufacturing, electricity, fine arts, transportation, and agriculture. A timer in the form of the Ferris wheel car is placed at the bottom of the center of the board on the Ferris wheel, and there's a round tracker that's also down at the bottom. Start player is randomly determined and every player gets a start bonus card based on that. This is the way they balance out start player advantage. They're going to place supporters, uh, which are cubes, on the board, as indicated by this bonus board, as well as placing one cube on every area. Now, each of the five areas also gets two face-up cards drawn from the deck. These are placed just outside of the area. If you can see it, it makes perfect sense. Thank you for the randomized start player, and not, you know, the last person who was on a midway or something. Yes, I do appreciate that. Now, each turn in World's Fair is really simple. The active player takes one of their cubes and puts it on one of the spots on the board. They then play any influential figure cards they've collected. These are going to let them add more supporters or manipulate the supporters already out, like putting one an extra one where they just went or putting one adjacent to where they went or putting one on a specific color. Next, they take all the cards from the area they just played in. Then you refill. 
you take three new cards, you add them starting at the spot you just emptied and go clockwise around the board, adding new cards. Now, each area only has room for either three or four cards. And if an area is filled, you just skip over to the next one. That's pretty much it. Now, what these cards are that you're drafting are main exhibit proposals. These are color coded to each of the five areas of the fair and feature actual exhibits from the real life World's Fair. Now, players are going to hold on to these and convert them into approved exhibit tokens during the scoring round. Towers of light, speeding steam engines and artistic marvels, mm -hmm. and even a car from Daimler that helped inspire Henry Ford. Yeah, if you look at that card in that picture on there, you're like, I really, that looks like a Model T. Uh, your next type are those influential figures I mentioned, the historical people. These have to be played on your turn if you have them. You don't get to hoard them. And they manipulate the supporter cubes. They're going to let you place more or move cubes. Figures like George Westinghouse, Ida B. Wells, Bertha Palmer, and Irvine Garland Penn. Next are midway tickets. Uh, these do two things. So first, each ticket collected advances the Ferris wheel car around the board. If it makes it back to the bottom, you have a scoring round. These tickets also will generate points during that scoring round. Take a ride on a hot air balloon, see Harry Houdini, or check out the Arabian horses. Now, each game of World's Fair 1893 will feature three scoring rounds. During these rounds, players will get points for every midway ticket they've collected in the form of coins, pennies, as well as bonus points if they have collected the most, which is two points. All midway tickets are discarded after players receive their points, so every round that resets. Next, you go around the board and you score those five areas that have come up multiple times here and starting from the one to the left of the Ferris wheel and going around it. Now, this scoring uses a pure area majority mechanic. Points are awarded based on how many cubes you have in each section compared to the other players and what rewards you get are based on how many players you're playing with, with a different scoring card for every player count. Now, for example, a full four player game, the player with the most supporters gets a gold medal, which is worth four points. And the player in second gets a silver medal, which is worth two points. Now, in the case of a tie for first, both players get a silver, any other ties get nothing. Now this is the actual game park. So no fun historical facts here. Medals in 1893 were made out of, no, we'd have, we would have had to Google that one. Now, in addition to these medals in this game, which are made of cardboard, players can also turn in proposed exhibit cards matching the area that's currently being scored to get exhibit tokens. Now, this is, again, based on that same area majority system and based on player count. So for four players, that first person who got the gold medal may convert up to three cards into tokens, whereas the person in second only gets to convert one and so on. You can, if you won, you could turn your French bakery, chocolate pavilion, and Brazilian coffee into exhibit tokens. You could. Those are all from the uh, agriculture, are they not? I think. Now, after each area scored, players return one half rounded down of their supporters to their own supply. So they don't build up over rounds. Now, after the third scoring phase, there is a final end game scoring. This is where you get points. Um, you're going to convert your stuff. So your midway coins and your medals, you don't really convert them because they have numbers on them. You just add them up. Then everyone's going to get points for those exhibit tokens. Here, um, it's all about variety. It's about collecting complete sets of five different types to get the most points. So if you have five different ones, so if you have at least one token in all the five exhibit areas, you get 15 points. For example, if you only add two, though, you get three points. And it's one of those where all of your tokens will be broken into sets down to one point for an individual set with only one token in it. Add all that up, player with most points wins. So now that we've covered how to play for people new to the game, let's get to the question I think most people want an answer on. Yeah. Is it worth picking up the new edition of World's Fair 1893? So I bought... World's Fair 1893, the original printing in June of 2016. Yes, that is the month it was released. And it has stayed in my collection ever since. This is a game that I'll play with my home group on Mondays and a game I will happily bring out to public play events to show off. I think this is a great lighter, like not the lightest, but lighter area majority game. And I have enjoyed every play I've ever played this game. I've never had a bad experience playing World's Fair. Now, the new edition is the same game. It's identical. There is no change to this game in this new edition in regards to gameplay. Now, I've said there are new cards added. Well, these replace duplicates from the base game with new historical figures on them. But they keep the same mechanics. Like the, the card distribution hasn't even changed. So due to this, 
I love the gameplay in World's Fair Second Edition just as much as I love the gameplay in the first edition because they're the same game. And I do love it. It is a fantastic game. And I think this is a smart move. As honestly, as I said earlier, this is already a solid mm-hmm. game, but it had some very narrow views and representation, which have now been somewhat addressed without having to sacrifice any of the actual game part of the game. Right. Yeah, it's good. like overall, the game still features really simple stage rules. Like I basically just taught you how to play. Like this isn't one of those where I'm going to tell you, go read on the blog to find the full details of the rules. I pretty much covered everything. And I got to say that the, the mechanics kind of fit the theme fairly well. Like I love the Ferris wheel and the midway tickets being used to control the timing. And there's a whole thing where, where you get later in the game, you're reshuffling the deck. So there's more midway cards. So it actually starts going faster. There's just some neat stuff going on there. And I actually adore the flavor text on these cards. The fact that every single one of these exhibit cards were actual exhibits and all of the historical figures are actual historical figures. I dig that aspect of the game. And I do have to say, almost everyone I introduce this game to spends their downtime between turns getting distracted by reading their cards and often actually learning something about the technology of the time period. Now, this does slow down the games a bit. I don't mind because you know what? Like there's an actual educational element to this game, which is something you don't always get out of board games. Because I know you're all interested in what Hagenbeck's menagerie really is. And I'm not going to spoil it. You're going to have to go pick up the game to find out. Now, it's this aspect of the game, the, the, the historical information and the, the flavor text that was actually improved in this new printing of World's Fair 1893 realizing that there were race and gender-based issues surrounding the World's Fair in 1893, addressing that and adding in more diverse historical figures is something I do applaud Renegade Game Studios for doing. Though I do find it a little odd that they chose to add seven new cards, but only four of them are actually black and only three of them are women. Like two of the new cards are more old white dudes. Also, with the new cards, there's only one of every single card of these new figures, whereas there's still at least two copies of all the original. So like their choice on who to replace and why is a little odd to me. While it's nice that they managed to keep the game balance and with that solid rating of the game, it's odd to the trouble of making, uh, to go to the trouble of making any changes yeah. uh, to make ones as minor as they have. Like I admit, it, I, I adore the the added diversity that's awesome i i do dig it i appreciate it i like that companies are actually thinking about these things now it shows actual progress in the industry that's awesome but it doesn't do anything to make the gameplay better and honestly i it doesn't feel like enough to warrant a full new printing of the game and well celebrating christopher columbus as this world's fair originally was intended to do is arguably not the best thing we can be doing uh, maybe they could have picked a different World's Fair, but then they probably have to find all new art and all new fairs. Now, the other thing that is why they made a new printing, and I, this I do understand, right? So this did ruin for new printing. They got a contract with Amazon, Amazon.com. They now have an exclusive game only available through Amazon. And due to that agreement, this is now available cheaper than the original and to a bigger market. I think this is a great thing for getting a great game into the hands of more people. So that is appreciated, which leads me to the conclusion that I think the second edition of World's Fair 1893 is a great game, well worth picking up, but only if you don't have the original. There's just not enough here to justify two copies of World's Fair, two copies of basically an identical game. Again, I I do appreciate the increased diversity. To me, though, that's just not enough to warrant buying another copy of a game I already own and enjoy. But if you haven't learned the joy of this game or already picked up your copy. It may be worth grabbing, right? Like, I, I, I just wish they'd done two things with this new product. For one, I wish they'd done more uh, to, to support people of color, to support indigenous people, to support underrepresented people. Uh, maybe doing something like donating a portion of the proceeds, whatever, a buck from every copy of the game sold gets donated to some worthy cause. That would have had me here in this exact same review saying, you know what? It's a great game. You probably worn out your original copy. Just go buy the new one. It supports a great cause. Unfortunately, I can't say that. Which leads me to the other thing I would have liked to have seen for those of us that do own the original is some kind of upgrade kit, some way to just get these new cards so we can make our actual copies of the game a little more diverse. And heck, maybe combine the two, right? Like put out a little expansion pack to get the new cards and donate something. I would have liked that. 
I don't think there's a good reason to buy the same game with all the same components with seven new cards and a couple paragraphs in the rule book. That's literally the only change. What I will say though, is if you don't own world's fair, go grab this. Like uh, this is going to appeal to most. Like if you're a hobby gamer, listen to us, you're probably going to dig this game. It's on Amazon and only on Amazon. And it even happens to be on sale right now at the time we're recording this sale. This show may still well be on sale after this 20% off right now. Just be sure to use one of our affiliate links if you do and help support this show. Yes, we would appreciate that. Now, if you are like me and already own World's Fair 1893, I leave the choice to you. Uh, I personally wouldn't feel it's worth upgrading. But for you, depending on your budget, maybe it is worth $40 for a whole new game for that added diversity and all the power to you. Well, that's it for our look at a new second edition of World's Fair 1893. I invite you to read more about this game in the review section of the blog over on TabletopBellhop.com. And now the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. All right, so this last week was awesome as far as playing games go, for both in person and digitally. Um, actually, with most of the games I'm going to talk about tonight being games, we did both. We played both in person and digitally. Um, due to this, normally when I do these uh, summaries, I try to keep it in chronological order. I'm going to throw that out this week because it's just going to make more sense to talk about one game, both types of games, and how many games we played of one game, and then move on to the next game. It's taken far too long, but we are kicking and screaming, coming to enjoy the more complex games allowed by Tabletop Simulator and not just hanging out on BGA all the time. So I don't know if enjoy is the right word in this case when talking about Tabletop space Simulator. Space, space, space. <laughs> space, space, yes. Space, space, yes. And that's what we're going to start with, right? So first up was Space, Space. I uh, played with Sean and Deanna on Tabletop Simulator. Now we did this because we were gonna be getting together with some of our awesome Patreon patrons on Sunday and playing. And I wanted to make sure we had the bugs worked out and were familiar with the interface and knew how it worked and how to set up our lobbies and all the stuff you had to do. So we played a three player game, uh, again, the three of us. And man, is that mod amazing. Sean found this mod. There are lots out there because I didn't even, I downloaded the wrong one the first time or subscribed to the wrong mod the first time. Sean found an amazing mod. We are totally dropping a link to that one in the chat and in um, the show notes because if you are interested in playing on Tabletop Simulator, this is the one to use. Now, this game went well um, the, as far as the game. Like, throw it out the factor on Tabletop Simulator. Just talking a game of space based with three players. Um, what I liked is it didn't have the runaway leader problem, like the total runaway leader problem we had the first time Sean D and I played. Um, I mentioned this game was in prep for a Patreon game, right? So, I don't know. Do you have anything to say about our three player game, really, before I move on to the Patreon game? Uh, I, I tried a new strategy that was a horrible strategy and I should never try again. <laughs> Other than that, no, I think it went well. Uh, all right, so yeah. So then we get to Sunday Nick, right? So it was three of us, Sean, Dan, and I facing off, right, facing off against like we're on teams <laughs> who weren't, we were all independent, uh, against Courtney Jackson and Evil John, two awesome folk and, um, that, that support the show. Uh, now, this was John's first time playing Space Base. And I got to say, while I preferred to teach it in person, this wasn't that bad. Like most of the time teaching on um, tabletop simulator is a little rough um, as we learned with some of the other games we'll be talking about a bit. Uh, but this mod was actually done well enough that explaining the game was not hard at all. Game was great. Um, surprisingly quick. I actually thought five player would really slow things down. And I know playing on tabletop simulator is slower than in person. Every game I played on tabletop simulator is slower than in person. The board game arena actually has the opposite effect. Many games are quicker. Tabletop simulator with all the fiddling with cameras and everything else and stacking things, always slower. I had a great time. Um, I personally could not get a point scoring engine working despite having five dock ships that generated points. I just couldn't do it. Now, what I did do is I managed to do a great job of making sure no one else would win for as long as I could in hopes that I'd keep up. But that was inevitable. Eventually, Courtney took it from us. Now, that was your third game, which I think at this point, you now play three times. You got a pretty good idea of the game overall. What do you think of it so far? On that third game, I finally didn't make any dumb mistakes either for or against me, which was a first. Uh, mm -hmm. And I tried yet another strategy to see how it played out. Uh, and that's one thing I really enjoy about this game is mm -hmm. that there are multiple paths to victory. Now, the dice might have some say in how successful any given path may be. Oh, yeah. 
But it actually turns out my third strategy might have been more successful if we'd not been playing extreme. Ah, uh, yeah, we do have to thank Courtney for that. Um, Courtney's in our chat, so thank you there. Uh, the day after playing the game, he pointed out that we've been playing Space Space Extreme. Um, in every game I've played, I somehow missed the rule that instead of buying a card, you can instead skip that phase and keep your credits. That makes high-cost colonies way more accessible and also means those rounds where you're like, I only have one, I can't buy anything. Well, you at least keep the one. Or you don't have those rounds where you're like, oh, all I can buy is a two-point card. I may as well buy this. Uh, I gotta thank you for the heads up on that. That does change the game. Now, I will note, yes, this changed the game. We have already published our review. Maybe we jumped the gun a bit. I, I didn't think we had. But I don't think this particular aspect of the game impacts anything we said in the review. I don't think this changes our thoughts on the game. I do dig the rule. I do prefer the game using it, but I don't think it changes anything we said. It doesn't prove us wrong. There was no complaint about the game. This fixes, um, but it does make us so you can buy the Like I never complained. You couldn't buy the more expensive cards. I just figured we, none of us were good enough to get there. And I played a game where people had like 45 credits and were able to buy the big one. So I thought that was just the, the way it was being played. Yeah, it, it darn shooting would have changed my outcome on Sunday, but yeah. it doesn't change my enjoyment of the game. It just would have shifted that one particular strategy differently, I think. No, I get it. So, like I said, and that's not, when we were explaining the rules, that's a type of little rule I probably wouldn't have even mentioned in the podcast version of the review anyway, which is why we tell people to go check out the blog version because I give a summary of the game. Please, we, we said it before, and I don't, I don't know if we have to start putting the disclaimer in the live show of please do not consider this a teaching video. <laughs> Maybe we should start putting that. Maybe you put it in text somehow, blink it or something. Because right. I do not intend these to be teaching videos, but I do want to summarize the game so people can sit there and go, oh, that sounds fun or not. Right. All right, next up, I set a record for Tapestry. I think this may be a record for, for the pile of obligation. I got the game, opened the box on Wednesday, recorded an unboxing on Friday and played it Friday night. I think that's the quickest turnaround. Now, we're not done. We still have to review it and everything else, but man, that got done. So I I think that's a record for getting a obligation game to the table. And I guess it's because I was hyped. I was really hyped to try this game out. Uh, Deanna tried to get me a copy for my birthday last year and couldn't get it. So we, we've been itching to try this game out. And we even got in a digital version of it as well. Yep, yep. So at this point, uh, before we get to the digital version, I played, no, this counts the digital version. I played Tapestry three times. So again, no final thoughts here. I am really digging it. Uh, two of these games were in person with just Deanna and I. And I got to say, it's to start, because this is worth mentioning, this game plays perfectly fine two players. Like there, there's no disadvantage I could see to playing two players. Um, the only part of the game that doesn't really happen because you only have two players is the fact certain things key off if your neighbors have things and while with two players you're both each other's neighbors but that was the same in our three-player game like both players were always your neighbors so you wouldn't actually see that effect till you get up to four and five players now this is not a new game i'm sure everyone is already well aware of the production quality of this game and how over the top it is um i honestly think this might be beating out mechs versus minions for the best produced game in my collection but what I do want to point out for anyone who's just seen the game from afar and hasn't touched it, this production isn't just the great looking full color landmarks. There are a lot of other little bits like the tray to organize the components and the biggest one being the texture that was added to the board so things don't slip around. That's also a huge part of it. Now, besides playing two players with D, as Sean mentioned, we also tried out a game on Tabletopia. Now, this was a three or five player demo version of the game. Um, this was so Sean could try it out. So when we get to the review, he at least knows what we're talking about when we talk Tapestry. And the Tabletopia version of Tapestry was the flip side of that amazing space-based mod. Um, well, it looked great, and it looked just like the game, and the pieces looked fantastic. It was extremely fiddly and frustrating to use. We spent most of our game just fighting with the interface. And unfortunately, I think this really impacted Sean's ability to judge the game. Like, here we are wanting to show up, check out this awesome game. We're loving this game. You got to play it. And instead, it's like, I can't move this. How do you unstack that? How do you move that? Oh, I can't. Oh, this fell over over here. Did you just drag that there? Where? How do you get cards in your hand? I never did figure out the hide hand, don't hide hand thing. I feel bad about that. 
That being said, I managed to come in second and noticed a mistake, which would have changed a cascade of things if I mm. noticed it in time. So while I wouldn't recommend people play the game this digital way, it was still able to break through that interface and difficulty as a solid game that I want to play for reals. So only for real. So I was like, never make me play that digitally again. Yeah. What scares me is there's a paid version. Like we played the free demo. I would have hate to have paid money for that. And yeah. I hope they've done something to improve that versus this demo version. Yeah. Overall, we're digging tapestry. Um, surprisingly quick to learn. Definitely has that difficult to master thing. Um, way more complicated than its four pages of rules indicate. Um, great civilization building game. And yes, despite what a number of people are saying, this is a civilization building game. I honestly don't get how anyone can say this is not a civilization game. Yes, you may be doing abstract things like moving a cube on a track or moving a building from one board to another, but those physical movements represent actual advances in things like technology and culture. And yeah, it might be odd that you can start researching lithium ion batteries and what's effectively the Stone Age, I don't see it as a problem. It just happens that this is an anachronistic civilization game. The fact it doesn't follow our established history and technological development as humans doesn't mean it's not a civ game. Honestly, part of the strange tech and civilization paths is the fun of it. Making yeah. up little stories about how you started from fire, married into a fellow civilization, then inventing glasses before ever learning about reading and writing are parts of the fun experience of it. I totally agree with you there. Now, the next game I want to highlight this week is Guildmaster. Uh, this has come up the last few weeks because we've been playing the heck out of this, actually. Uh, we've been playing quite a bit of the game. Uh, it's from Good Games Publishing. We're trying to get a review up because this is one we should have done and then the pandemic hit and we've only been able to play with two players. Now we have tried it at all player counts. That's one of the main things I wanted to do before publishing a review. We played it at two, three, and four players, uh, multiple times at four. Almost reviewed the game tonight, but I've actually been in contact with the publisher over on their Discord with a couple of rule issues and stuff like that. And they heard my complaints about the two-player experience, basically where I said they shouldn't have put it on the box. And well, of course, they weren't overly happy about that, right? Like this was, wasn't, wasn't one of those publishers going, you're wrong. But what they asked is that now that Deanna and I have played multiple games, right, that we now go back and try two-player again. So you know what? I'll do it. I'll, I'll give them a shot. They say it's a completely different game with two players, so we'll put the review off a little bit more. Plus the publisher can't be mad at putting it out because they're the ones that told me to play it again, right? Now, as for the game plays, I've mentioned how much better the game is with four. Um, that stands as well, it's still good with four. It also works really well with three. Well, we didn't see a lot of conflicts in our three player game, they did come up. Um, you didn't have people make, taking the same order all that often as with four. Um, but all that stuff, I don't like it too. The auction, the prisoner's dilemma, the bidding worked great with three players. Now, the problem we did have playing with three players that, again, we played with Sean on Tabletop Simulator. Now, this is Tabletop Simulator, not Tabletopia. So the scripting issue is not a platform issue. It's how much work they put into these games, it seems. And despite being a fully scripted mod, it was very difficult to play online this way. Um, similar to Tapestry, I'm almost like, man, we should have saved Guildmaster for when Sean could come to town. Because he's like, this is a great game, you'll dig it. And he's like, I don't know if it's my kind of game. Well, not only is it not his type of game, now we made him play it on a horrible interface. <laughs> well, I still don't think it's a game that will ever be on my must-play list. That doesn't mean it's a bad game in any way. Uh, though the digital version makes me not want people to play that way. Yes, it's... There is a lot of holding cards and stacking cards in piles and putting money on those piles, which sounds really easy to do in person because it is. Doing that digitally was not fun. Now, overall, taking a look at all my plays of Guildmaster overall, including Sean and playing with the rest of the family, it's a win, at least playing physically. We're digging in a three, we're digging in a four, and you know what? I'll do the two-player thing. We'll try it. Maybe it really will turn into this interesting game of cat and mouse. That's what the, the designer described their two-player experience with. So we'll see if that's true. Next up, I have a game I never thought I would be talking about on a weekend review when it's just Deanna and I playing, and that is Riff Raff. 
Now, I talked about when Sean and I played this game, and I tried to get across the fact of just how difficult this game is physically as a dexterity game. This is a game where you're not going to get all the pieces to stack on the thing. And in a big aspect of the game is actually trying to catch stuff that falls off. It is a very unique twist on deck building using this ship that you're putting pieces on that's on a gimbal and is super watery. Water, watery? Wobbly. Deanna, supposedly, I, I, I just don't believe her anymore, hates dexterity games. And I'm just thinking this isn't true. She loved Go Cuckoo. She loves Riff Raff. I think she just hates some dexterity games. And this wasn't one of them. So I got D to play Riff Raff and she really enjoyed it. Uh, if you saw the pictures I've shared online, she's got a big grin on her face playing this game. And I'm shocked. I'm I, like, I was the one that pushed for her. I'm like, come on, you got to try it. You got to try it. Come on, you got to try it. She's like, all right. And then she did it. She's like, okay, I admit that was a lot of fun. <laughs> so yeah, shocking. Is there anyone out there who expected D to be playing Riff Raff without perhaps a gun to her head? Oh, come on. Now she's saying she'll never needs to play it again. <laughs> You're just you're just you're just trying to uphold the reputation there. You had fun. Finally, earlier today, after getting her second COVID shot, we sat down with my oldest and played a three player game of World's Fair 1893 as some last minute prep before tonight's review. Now, again, I've owned this game for a long time, played it many times, but I wanted to make sure I got it to the table a few extra times before our review tonight. And. It was good. My daughter liked it. I don't. I don't know. If she loved it. She seemed kind of. I don't know. She that she she's uh, she's of an age where it's hard to get an opinion from her. We'll put it that way. And she seemed to enjoy it. I don't think she loved it. Still dig the game. Really enjoy it. Deanna destroyed us. I don't know what we were doing compared to what she did. Like first round, she was doing terrible, and then we ignored. I think. I have never seen someone complete that many sets. <laughs> Super quick game, plays extremely well three players. Daughter enjoyed it. What I did want to mention here is what we did after was we took my old copy and the new copy. Now, I had quickly opened up both and compared them. Wow, they do look the same. Well, we did like card to card comparison. And that's where I was able to confirm that it is literally no balance change, nothing changed. Like these, everyone keeps saying they added seven new cards. Well, they didn't add, they replaced seven cards with cards with new art and text. Literally, that's it. Mechanically, it's the same. The balance is identical. There's just as many of every card. There's just as many of how everything's balanced. It is literally the same game with some new art on some stuff and a new pair. Uh, sorry, a couple paragraphs. A new and a basically short essay that's in the in the rule book. So that was another big part of playing this last game was to confirm it. Deanna was the one. She's like, I am taking these apart and I am trying to figure it out. And we and that's where we got a little confused by what seven cards they did choose to add. But we talked enough about that in the review. Oldest daughter dug it. Great game. Again, if you don't own it, pick this up like 20% off right now on Amazon. I doubt it'll get much better than that because it is an Amazon exclusive. You're probably not going to find this one since like, I, I don't know if you'll ever see third party sellers on this one. Fantastic. I Gateway area majority. I hate saying gateway because it's just got that little bit of level. Like it's just a step above. If you like, if you played El Grande, this is going to seem simple. But if you haven't, a really solid game. I do recommend it. So how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? All right. So it's it's gonna be a it's gonna be a good month, I think. July is just gonna be like the best gaming month we've had since uh, the pandemic hit. So I do have a couple packages from Bulgaria show up, which seems weird, but Bulgaria happens to be the home country of Folded Space, a company that specializes in foam core inserts. Now I contacted them a little while back and convinced them to send me three box inserts with the agreement that I will do a live stream and build those. So that's something I hope to start on this weekend, getting at least one of these done. That's my goal is to have one done this weekend. With some bunch of stuff that's going on, I actually don't know if I'm going to be able to fit this in. So we're going to try. Um, the first one, though, I'm not even going to spoil what they all are, but the first one is for Zaya, Legends of a Drift System, that giant long box, including all the expansions. So including uh, Embers of a Forsaken Star, the, the Cell Sword, the extra missions, and all the Kickstarter exclusives. So I have a bunch of Kickstarter cards and stuff because I did back that one. So I am really looking forward to that one. Uh, and since uh, Folded Space doesn't involve <laughs> any hammers or other weapons, we should have a much better experience filming this build compared to our failed first attempt at filming an insert build. 
This won't be our first one though. We did build the eminent domain inserts. So That's you can see that on YouTube. You can check that out. And those actually proved to be quite popular, which is why I thought I would do this. Plus being able to organize IO will be awesome so I can never play it again. <laughs> I hope that's not actually true. Uh, next, we have a double date game night planned on Friday with Kat and Tori, Kator for fans of our Gloomhaven streams who we haven't been able to game with since March, 2020. Um, right now, my plan spoiler, if you happen to be listening, is to play Trap Words to get it off the pile of shame because I want to play that with another group of people. Space Base, because you just need to see this game. I think you'll love it. And Unfair, which is another game that we've been struggling to get to the table during the pandemic. And then maybe some riffraff for Tori's sake because he seems to really dig the dexterity games. Now, if somehow, magically, we still have time, I would love to throw Tapestry down on the table, but I think that's going to wait for a future game night. All right, and well, with my masks game retired, we're actually starting up a new Supers adventure this week under nice. the Amazing Heroes system. We're going to see how that goes. And of course, we will be here on Sunday for Sunday brunch talking about who knows what. Um, maybe we'll have some games to talk about then. Now a quick shout out and thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. All right, first, Sean P. Kelly of the Awesome Gaming MBS RPG podcast, which you should check out. Uh, they record on Monday nights mainly, but I get so many go live notifications from them anymore. I think they just stream everything they do RPG related from prep to mapping to actual plays. So find them here on Twitch, subscribe, a couple awesome guys talking RPGs. Andrew Dacey, thank you. Diane Tuzano, thanks, Ma. Misdirected Mark. Join the Misdirected Mark every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern right here on Twitch. And finally, uh, speaking of Misdirected Mark, coming from the King Panda, Papa Swick, Mr. Joe Swick. Thanks, Joe. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end, and for Ryan's sake, we're going to have to drop that portcullis. Though the doors to the lobby are closed and the portcullis is down, you can always find us across the web as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can visit our website at tabletopbellhop.com, find our podcast on your podcatcher of choice, and sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com for weekly updates. As always, links down below. We need to find a way to make that shorter, but still get all the information across. Now, if you do like the content we're providing, it would like to support our continued efforts, including possibly playing some games with us on Tabletop Simulator. Please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For the lobbyists, thanks for joining us. And be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show and stop by Sundays for brunch. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.